It's an honor and a pleasure to be standing on the same stage and same room with Dr. Ray. I don't know if you remember last symposium when he was here and he gave a talk. He, there was a standing ovation for him after his talk and for his contribution to environmental medicine. Dr. Ray, um, he is the founder and director of the Environmental Health Center in Dallas. He has authored more than 10 medical textbooks and has published over 115 research papers related to many topics including cardiovascular surgery and environmental medicine. He is a pioneer in creating numerous environmental units throughout the world, including countries like Mexico, Brazil, Japan, China, to name a few. During his long-lasting career, he has treated numerous patients with chemical sensitivity and chronic degenerative diseases. He has also trained hundreds of physicians on the facts and principles of environmental medicine. Again, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Bill Ray for his talk, and the title of his talk is Environmental Aspects of Mold and Mycotoxins and the Approach to Treatment. Thank Dr. Ray. Thank you very much. Well, some of the uh, physicians, uh, uh, I would say, offspring are here, as I just met one from uh, uh, down in South Texas uh, who had uh, known my, uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Dora Brown, who was the, in Fredericksburg, who was uh, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon that did uh, this kind of work. And he had taught me a lot about molds. Now, one thing I've learned about molds living in Dallas is you can, can you see these black streaks on this uh, uh, wood here? This is a typical construction in Dallas as they build the uh, buildings through the, mold, through the wet water, through the rain, and then it grows mold. And it has no chance. It starts out. Uh, growing mold and goes right on. So here you are building mold right into your new building, which is ridiculous. And as you can see here, black mold is even much worse underneath this uh, uh, garage here. Now, I guess uh, no, it would take uh, nobody to be able to diagnose uh, mold on this one, and there's only one treatment for this uh, one, and that's a bulldozer. A lot of times mold is uh, hidden uh, behind the sheetrock, and uh, this uh, is an example of it here. And here, guess, guess what this is? This is mold growing behind a refrigerator. How many of you look at your, behind your refrigerator every once in a while? Well, if you don't, I think you ought to because you may have mold growing there because of the moisture. And of course, this is not so, this is a very subtle with not so mold, obvious mold growth, but there you can see the bulging with it. Now, here's a group of patients that we saw 150 uh, females, 91 males, 59 that were affected. The ages were 1 to 78 years old, with a mean of 44. Uh, there are about uh, uh, 100,000 to 1,500 species of molds, and uh, that's rust, mildew, smuts, mushrooms, yeast. And yeast is a colloquial name for single-cell members of the fungal family. And they're Ascomycetes and Basidiomycetes, an imperfect fungi that tend to be unicellular for the greater part of their life cycle. The major types of molds are things like Aspergillus niger, which is the black mold, aflatoxins and oclatoxins in that family, Stachybotrys, the trichloral ethanes, Cladosporums which are the most common molds, but don't seem to be quite as harmful as other molds. Alternaria, Fusarium, 
uh, which the trichothecenes are there, and then the ergot molds, or St. Anthony's fire. And I'm going to show you a picture of that later on of why we changed from uh, rye to wheat. And the reason we did was because the molds grew better on uh, the uh, rye than they did the wheat. You wouldn't know it today, but it is true. And I'll show you that a little later. So the most common indoor and outdoor molds are uh, in the air in Dallas, Cladosporum, Alternaria, and Aspergillus. And they cause signs and symptoms and disease in humans, and they may be a cause for common viruses and bacteria because they mess up T cells and they mess up gamma globulin and they dysfunction complements. And so these kind of things one has to measure if they have tough mold cases because they need to uh, do something in addition uh, to talk, talking about them. Now, mold cultures indoors, you can see there are all kinds of them that we find in there. And Halmanthosporum is last on the list, but so is Rhizopus, and so is Bipolaris, whereas Alternaria, uh, Aspergillus penicillium, and Cladosporum are the most common ones. Now, where do they where do they work? Respiratory trees, obviously, and rhinitis and sinusitis and the lungs. But as you can see also, there are other things which will give you things like hoarseness, pharyngitis, hearing loss, nervous system, and small vessel vasculitis. As a vascular surgeon, I uh, was st uh, stunned when I went into this uh, field because of the cold hands, cold feet, uh, cold fingertips, blue fingertips, and blue toes uh, because of the small vessel vasculitis that goes along with the autonomic nervous system of these type patients. And the neurological symptoms uh, or neurovascular seem to be one of the big ones. And what we see a lot of times are people with headaches, migraines and other headaches, and about 90% of the people uh, have confusion when they have these headaches. The other thing they have is uh, about half of them, short-term memory loss. So you ask a patient, well, how's your memory? Well, doc, not so good now, you know? And then the other thing you see is the inability to concentrate. And so you have uh, tr trouble with that. And then if you have them stand on their toes, they can't do it with their eyes open or closed, one of the two or both, or they can't walk a straight line. They fall right off the straight line. So these are simple uh, findings that you can do uh, with your patients and know right away what some of the problems are, okay? Now, the other thing that uh, you get is you, you can break it down farther and have uh, uh, more uh, vascular phenomena, neuro problems, and also uh, anaphylaxis occasionally. But it's really not, if you test them carefully, it's, it's not uh, a big problem. Diarrhea, some bloating when the food hits the stomach, they bloat. Well, why do they do that? Uh, because uh, it's a it's a food, and they shouldn't bloat. But if they go ahead and and uh, have uh, some problems with the uh, vagus nerve and the uh, vascular phenomena in that area, they'll bloat. The other thing they'll do, which uh, is quite interesting, is they will get uh, themselves sleepy or real tired 
when the food hits the stomach. They may choke a little bit in their esophagus, but when, they, when it hits their stomach, they may eat. I've seen them go to sleep many times with this. So it's something that a lot of them will note and see, OK? And then, of course, uh, uh, diarrhea or constipation, either way, when it screws up the vascular to the smooth muscle. And then, of course, uh, uh, urinary frequency uh, and burning will occur. And then your thigh muscles, a lot of times, will start aching. So there are a lot of, a lot of things that one can see uh, that really occur uh, with molds and mycotoxins in excess. And usually, by then, you've got the diagnosis, and you can give it. And of course, the other thing that one sees a lot of is a lot of joint pain and a lot of uh, muscular spasm. And, and uh, of course, even prostatitis uh, and bladder spasm, we'll see. In the skin, skin, endocrine, hypothyroidism, other hormone imbalance, and so on. Now, the question is, how can you diagnose this for sure? We had a, a discussion a little earlier about uh, how you can tell. Well, there are four mold mixes that uh, one can do that uh, will help them uh, do a clinical diagnosis. And the first, first one is mold mix one, and this has altern area, hormodendrum, and aspergillus in it. And if you do, you do a provocation test under good controlled conditions, you get 89%. If uh, it's mold mix two, it's epicoccum, fusaria, polaria, uh, and that would be 93%. And uh, mold mix three, mucor, fomo, and fomis, and rotatula, you get 86%. And uh, Mold mix four, cephalosporin, helminthosporum, nephthemphilum, and geotrachum. We will do these individually on patients. And then if we have to even narrow them down farther, if we, usually they will work as treatment when you get the right uh, dilution of it. It'll shut off the reaction. And so you can get yourself of about 14 molds in the uh, 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 testing of the mold. You can test them individually if you need to, but if you don't, it's better not to. The other thing you can do is test the uh, uh, okra toxin, the uh, uh, different uh, mycotoxins individually, and you can use those to shut off reactions also. And therefore, a lot of times, you don't have to worry about the uh, problems from the toxin. A lot of times it'll just shut off like that and or within five to 10 minutes. So it's a, it's a tool that's wonderful to use. And I would urge you all to learn to, to, to do that because it saves not only time, but money. Now, these are other interdermal provocations that we use. And as, as you can see, uh, there are quite a few others. And you can take almost any mold and do a pro 0.05 cc's interdermally as a uh, uh, nice uh, provocation. I want to point out one thing. Uh, we, we made leptospheria and physosphere way down at the bottom. Fabulous after the rain mold. The people who uh, get sick after a rain, uh, these things are doing. Well, in our infinite wisdom this last year, the feds took it off the market because it might be a war gas. And uh, I think it was so absurd because this really helped so many people. And uh, then they just lost it just like that. Now, what, what are the symptoms? Well, uh, sort of these uh, groups, uh, 
are provoked. For example, you get itching and headache and tight throat and cough on mold mix one. You get uh, shortness of breath, cough, tight throat, nose running, dizziness, tiredness, sleepiness on mold mix two. And uh, you get uh, mold mix three, a lot of sneezing and headaches and nausea and sleepiness. And mold mix four, a heavy chest. I don't know whether you've seen people come in you know, and their chest will be real heavy and they wonder what the heck is causing it. Well, you can go right away to mold mix four and suspect it is. Nausea, sleepiness, red face. Have you seen patients come in with red faces? They a lot of times will have red faces and red hands and uh, they'll see it. And of course, uh, that, that'll, that'll happen. And then uh, itching with rise of it. Now, you can go on and on on the different symptoms and a lot of times they will be produced. I, I'm always happy when I reproduce symptoms because I don't have to take anybody's word. I don't have to take the patient's word. I don't have to take any of the other people's word for it. I know that we can uh, do this. And so uh, interdermal challenge to me is the way one really needs to go. Uh, and a lot of people have given this up because there are easier ways, but they can't tell what they're doing. So my uh, talk is to urge you to, uh, to do these, and particularly when you're not sure what's going on. All right. And we've talked about the rain mold. So here's a history. I thought being a heart surgeon, I was quite interested in this case. This guy had a rheumatic fever as a child. And in uh, 1976, he received a mitral valve replacement. Uh, he presented at our clinic with uh, uh, constant arrhythmias, PVCs, atrial fibrillation, and was told that he needed another valve replacement. Well, he suddenly developed a bradycardia, and so we had to put in a pacemaker. And uh, it was found before he got his second valve that uh, his worst arrhythmia has occurred in the fall, in the mold season, when he was eating certain moldy cheeses. So it was a combination of moldy cheeses and a moldy season. Well, he's still well with 21 year follow up, no medications, mold injections. He avoids pizza with moldy cheese during the mold season, and he still has his heart valve. He never got that other heart valve. So I thought that was a pretty good example of what one can do with mold injections once they uh, find the right thing for him. So uh, again, I would urge you all to learn that technique. Now the mold cultures indoors in 68 houses we tallied up and alternaria was found in 100% of the houses. Aspergillus in 100% and cladosporum in 100%. Tachybotrys in 80% and epicoccus in 80%. Crufalia in 79% and uh, so on down the line. So you can find those in these mold cultured houses that like I showed at the beginning. The intradermal neutralization and testing one can uh, do to help obliterate these and you don't have to use toxic medication or you don't have to use uh, other type of things. You just use the mold mixes. Now, these are a lot more molds that one can do intradermally. And uh, these uh, come on plants, Alternaria does 
and they're found in the lungs and skin, high in the summer and winter, not bad in the spring or fall. Aspergillus is a soil fungus. It grows on any substance, damp hay, grain, sausage, fruit, anything you want to see. Coffee beans, drink a cup of coffee and you're drinking some molds. Just think of that when you drink your coffee. That's uh, quite, a, quite a story. Uh, Hormonodendrum, decomposing plants, leather, rubber, cloth paper, uh, wood products, spores, and so on. So there are many species of some of these molds and that's what makes it difficult. Also, for example, uh, Aspergillus here, there's, there's uh, five of them right there. The Aspergillus niger, a black mold, but uh, Fumigatus, Flavus, Versicolor, and, and Okrus cause kidney failure, okay? So they are different for different things. Uh, with the mold mixed twos, you get soil decaying vegetables, plant leaves, and uncooked fruits. Fusarium, parasite on green plants, such as peas, beans, cotton, tomato, corn, sweet potato, rice on decaying plants. Polaria, soil also on decaying vegetation. On mold mix three, you get it on animal waste in barnyards. Foma grows on paper products and books. You know those old books when you get the odor of those, uh, you go around in a li library of old books. That's your uh, uh, Foma. Fomese uh, is found in rotting wood. And I think that's what we got to remember is uh, you know, mold's uh, job is to uh, disintegrate things like rotting wood. In mold mix four, cephalosporum, uh, helminthosporum, corn, wheat, oat and rye, stenphilium, damp paper, and then geotrichum, sour milk, milk products, cheese, pickles and other things like penicillium, rhizopus, oropomolomycetes. And the other thing is we don't talk about hardly at all is lake algae. And if you look in Texas right now, all the lakes are green and uh, that's full of algae and uh, in the water. And so it can cause problems in people living near that. And of course, TOE, trichophyton, oidium, and epidermal phyton, and they can cause skin lesions, at, uh, athlete's foot, nasal and ear sores, oral thrush, fungus under the nails, vaginitis, and CNS problems, candida, and stachybotrys, of course, with the grain and damp buildings, black mold, black mold. And here we are with the cladis more, most common airborne mold in the temperate zone and the tropics uh, occurring year round, indoors and outside, uh, on creosote treated wood, face cream, dead disease plant tissues, foodstuffs, paints, textiles. It almost occurs on anything and it is the most common mold. Uh, the Dresselia is a genus uh, Helminthosporum associated with airborne plants, soil found in growing plants, predominant in the spring, in summer and fall. And you want to know these somewhat. I, I can't ever remember them, so I always have to look them up. But every season, there's something different. And if you don't do it, a lot of times you won't get your mold patients under control. And the same with these new molds, I think, as we talked about a little bit. So in summary, uh, molds are every place in the world. Molds are how nature disintegrates substances. Molds can cause hypersensitivity. Mold can affect any part of the body. 
especially ear, nose, and throat, and respiratory, and circulatory, and neurological system. And uh, they must be treated by avoidance, injection therapy, and nutrition aggressively. Moles cause uh, signs and symptoms and disease in humans, and they may cause it as common as virus and bacteria. And that's something we don't want to forget because uh, uh, we think viruses are more common, we think bacteria are more common, when in fact they aren't any more common than moles, okay? Now, what, do, what does mold do to the body? Well, what mechanism goes around? Well, one thing it can do, it can knock out white counts. And uh, so we see this series of patients where the moles sometimes they'll get down to uh, uh, very low areas. And when you got a patient with a low white count, think of mold. Don't th Whereas we usually think of uh, viruses, but sometimes it's mold. And of course, if it's high, it's due to bacteria usually, isn't it? And here's the autonomic nervous system done by pupillography where you see uh, changes in the autonomic nervous system. It's one of the things that's done by that. And of course, mycotoxins are the toxic metabolites of fungi. And penicillin happens to be a beneficial one. And there are 200,000 to 3 million fungal uh, metabolites. So we've just started on uh, the uh, molds that can cause metabolites that can cause problems. Uh, now, what was the first mycotoxin to cause uh, mass illness? Does anybody need no? Hooper says he does. What, what was it, Hooper? Huh? Ergot, there it is, right there. <laughs> In Middle Ages, okay. There they are. There's pictures of people with had ergot poisoning, and they had uh, uh, these beggars all had lo lots of limbs, both legs and uh, hands. And this is why society switched to wheat uh, from rye. Apparently, it grows better on rye. So therefore, society uh, switched to heat, 14th century. Now, I think we all have talked about all the, these mycotoxins. And uh, they are things that people, uh, some, some people talk about, some people don't. As you can see, some of the things like the uh, uh, hepaclatic acid, and the other one, which is too much for this surgeon. And you can see all of the uh, mycotoxins that come about with cladosporum. Alternaria has got some, um, and aspergillus has the aflatoxin, the okra toxin, and the trichos of things. So we, we, Hooper's got a lot more things he's got to do to uh, uh, give us a full picture of all these things. Aflatoxins, corn, coffee, peanuts, pistachio, almonds, Brazil nut, milk, dairy, beer, eggs, and poultry, and trichosethenes, they're just 150 types. We know stachybotrys and fusarium, uh, and of course, uh, the fuminescence, which are barley, sorghum, beer, and pigs, and horses. I doubt if there's hardly anything in society that we eat that really doesn't have some kind of molds. And other molds that uh, are found is uh, one that I, I think is very interesting is the penetrins. People shake, shake like this. This week, I think we've had two or three patients come in uh, with tremors 
one was told they had Parkinson's disease. Well, I don't doubt that they had Parkinson's disease. That's just a name, clinical name we've put on there. The, the difference is, why is it that a patient who has uh, uh, tremors, why can't they have a triggering agent like a mole? And here it is. It's already in the literature, you know. So I would uh, urge you to think of some of these other things that you have when you see somebody tremoring. It may, may not be what we call classical Parkinson, but it may be another thing that uh, causes tremors. And you can see uh, the uh, things go on and on as far as the mycotoxins. Some of them, uh, uh, patulin, fusarium, penicillic acid, mycophenolic acid, Roquefortine from Roquefort cheese. So where are the molds found? And I just heard somebody some, say someplace, they are not found in Arizona. Not true. It's just a different type that's there. So you get moist climates, drought years, moldy buildings, and moldy foods. One of the biggest problems are old buildings. And I noticed this uh, building doesn't seem to have any mold in yet, which is pretty good, but it's not an old building. And you get an old building and you can count on some kind of a mold being there, okay? Now, where do mycotoxins go? Well, any system in the body. So you can get liver damage, uh, you can get uh, cancer from aflatoxins, immune deregulation, aflatoxins, trichosethane, okra toxin, kidney damage from the uh, okra toxin, and so on, and the respiratory, and also sinuses, and particularly, I think, brain damage. I think that one of the biggest things we have in our society today are uh, mycotoxins that go to the brain, and we see this all the time going up to the, no up the nose, causing an increase in sensitivity, causing a frontal area, then going to the hippocampus, and so on. So we don't want to forget all these things. And uh, also, it can mess with young women's uh, uh, premature uh, telarchy and breast enlargement, breast shrinking and uh, blood vessel spasm, which are not talked about as much. Hematopoietic and reproductive and uh, tumor causing the other thing. And of course, neurotoxic is a big one. I just saw a kid yesterday who uh, was vomiting every time he went to school. And the school was moldy, turned out School was moldy, and it staggers, of course. Uh, I have them walk a straight line, and a lot of times they just can't do it. And uh, or they can't do it with their eyes closed. Other, uh, other things uh, are like the sulfa means. And I, and I think one of the big ones is cancer, because if you get a neurological problem that goes on, for 20 years, a lot of times it turns into cancer. Trichosthene is one of the big ones we measure. Loss of appetite, anorexia, vomiting, modulate serotonin. We always test for serotonin uh, and see if we can turn it off. Taste aversion, which is mediated in the area post adrenal Fumacine, laminin, limping along like Ray does, except I had polio. And uh, ataxia, oral and facial paralysis, head pressing. Uh, I always thought this was interesting in kids. You know, little kids a lot of times will have head pressing where they'll press against the wall, uh, cerebral malacia, and so on down the line. And of course, we saw, talked about the tremor gens. and sulfuramine. Okay, 
Now, I'm going to go ahead, 168, 168 patients with mycotoxin. And uh, what I want to do is tell you how we treat them. And with number one being avoidance. Now, with some of these we got biopsies of, and I won't bore, bore you with that. Uh, and here's 76 where we had all sources of it, and uh, okra toxins, trichosethenes, 164. Uh, I can't urge you on how valuable intradermal testing is because you can produce provocation, and that's the different things here. Okay. Also, one thing we've seen on patients who grew up in moldy houses is premature telarchy, increased mammary size, testicular atrophy, and swollen prepus, vulva vaginitis, <coughs> breast enlargement in boys, endocrine uh, changes in the glucocorticoids. And you know, uh, estrogenic effect of xerolone, cervical cancer, tumor generis, impaired cell immunity, rectal and vaginal prolapse, spermogenesis. Do you guys recognize this as maybe the textbook of medicine? That's what I see uh, here, is probably one of the things that can cause this. <clears throat> of the molds and mycotoxins, TNB lymphocyte. You know, we, we get a select group of patients who are usually about the worst in the world. I like some, some like Neil was talking about, and maybe even worse uh, there. Uh, but 80% basically are abnormal in their TNB lymphocytes. Okay, so... Uh, uh, that's in 100 patients uh, that we did. And there, these are breakdown for the helper and suppressor cells and the B cells and so on. Okay, what about uh, pup pupillography for the autonomic nervous system? Well, <clears throat> normal are 57%, but uh, abnormal are all the rest. So. Uh, probably about half the patients with neurotoxicity are abnormal. What about triple camera spec brain scans? <clears throat> Here's a nice normal spec brain scan, 3D. You can see how smooth it is, how it's outlined and the like, and how the Temporal lobes are good. Oh, okay. You can't even see the slide on your immediate left, and then you can see the slide on the next there, uh, sort of fuzzy all over. And then if you look in the middle slide or the middle uh, picture, you'll see all those areas there of which are. Uh, non-vascular areas. And then if you look at the temporal lobes on the uh, other side, they're all abnormal also. So how do we treat uh, moles? Well, number one is avoidance. Clean room, charcoal, urine mycotoxins. You've got to neutralize them either with nutrients or with injection provocation. Uh, every four days. Sometimes you do it every day. Evaluation of T and B cells, complements and gamma globulins, uh, and I've never seen anything so severe as getting gamma globulins for patients. It's the worst political mess I've ever seen in my life in medicine. The T and Bs, we have developed something akin to stem cells, but it's legal and uh, it's made out of the patient's own blood where we grow it for several weeks. And uh, 
It's called uh, autogenous lymphocytic factor, and it does work. And if you look at the gamma globulins, you must look at the uh, subsets of the gamma globulins, one, two, three, and four, because they're the ones that are usually messed up. Of course, number four is nutrition. Five is oxygen therapy, in, anywhere from four to eight liters a minute for two hours every day for 18 days to 36 days, and sauna if they can tolerate it. And a lot of them can't, can't tolerate it. These are our clean rooms, uh, of which uh, uh, porcelain, uh, sand fused on steel at uh, uh, 2,000 degrees. Uh, this is a room for electromagnetics where there's copper screen and copper slab in, on, on the floor because that won't transmit uh, the, the uh, EMF waves. Uh, houses uh, that have been remodeled after molds, one has to be very careful. Like uh, the previous talks were saying, you know, you, not everybody can afford to, to uh, uh, get, get a house that's uh, per perfectly right. On the other hand, you do the best you can. Eliminate the leaks in the most moist areas. Now, some have to be bulldozers. Uh, apartments and condos are the worst. I, I believe I've been convinced not to live in an apartment anymore because they're so toxic, and so many of them are toxic. Uh, monitor urine for the mycotoxins, and spore counts, not very good, and plates with more than five colonies, that means your air no good, and that you can get those. Houses that have been built or remodeled after mold contamination, boy, suspect those. Get clean home. This happens to be one with clean aluminum wallpaper, ceramic floors, uh, a carpet that is washed. This is a trailer that was uh, designed uh, all porcelain. So it's, it's mold free other than what comes in and outside. This is one who had a glass floor and hardwood furniture and washable. Again, elegant one with uh, hardwood floors and, and organic cotton furniture, and another one here. And uh, this is an elegant room, which is all white, not any dyes. Again, glass table, glass uh, on three walls. Kitchen with ceramic and no mold in it, and another one like that. So you can monitor with mold plates and mycotoxins and uh, with real time. This is just uh, shows we make our own antigens and they're preservative free. And, and so you can neutralize and provoke uh, with these. They have to be frozen every night of which we have frozen. Or you can do sublingual and they don't have to be frozen. The uh, lymphocytic factor, ALF, modulates the immune system. Uh, once the total load is reduced, it works excellent. In 100 patients, this is 88% uh, got well. It's saying changes in your T and B profiles, which shows it before and after it's hard to see that, but they did go up considerably. Uh, the CMI, where you read in 48 hours uh, and gives you another uh, avenue of uh, T cell function, 74% uh, were increased, no change in 12, decreased in 14. So uh, I think this is. Uh, all we really got on this. And, uh, oh, aut autogenous vaccine. A lot of times we'll make, when we uh, have our back against the wall and nothing seems to work, we'll just take whole blood, spin it down, and uh, 
uh, sterilize it and give it back to the patient. And on, a lot of times that works. Mold patients frequently get food sensitive. And if you don't address that, you will find problems with your uh, patients not getting well. And so a lot of times you have to put them on a rotary diet, uh, but also other times you can, uh, and, and organic food, and I must say safe water, uh, and it should be glass bottled, not plastic bottled, because I've measured that and that puts uh, hexane and two and three methyl pain, pentane into a clean water, which is not good. And then of course, failure of nutrient therapy uh, is, a, is a problem. And here we're uh, uh, 575 patients, and I guess it's a little too here to show, but the nutrient vaccine worked in most of it. Now for the oxygen therapy, we use the Von Ardine technique. Uh, Al Johnson uses uh, uh, a different type of hyperbaric, but both of these, we use a ceramic mask, plastic tube that's been boiled, glass bottle, the old fashioned tanks, and cellophane with, uh, with uh, popular wood on that, and you can do that for two hours uh, a day on some of these patients. And what you should do is measure their PVO2, measure it in the anti-cubital with no tourniquet. That'll tell you how much is extracted. And I've had them up to uh, 60, uh, 70, 80 percent not extracted, and they were going on 20 percent oxygen. Uh, because of their uh, tissue was not extracting it. And that, I've seen people, I, I had a lady just the other day who did a uh, oxygen therapy for two hours on the start of her 18 days, and she had Parkinson's, and, and she uh, uh, almost stopped all of her Parkinson's on this. So it's a powerful tool when used properly. And it's simple and cost effective. And this is a group of 67 patients that we did that uh, shows where there was, uh, afterwards there was 20 to 35% uh, PVO2 and before it was 30 to 64%. Hot air sauna is the other thing we would use for the mold sensitivity. A lot of mold patients can't sweat and uh, so you have to gently put them in for five, 10 minutes. And we like to try to use a hardwood ceramic uh, sauna uh, in some way. And of course, you can break up some of this with massage. Uh, so the other thing is, of course, nutritional, decision, uh, nutritional therapy, the biggest one I find and most people don't talk about this, and I'm not quite sure I understand why, but uh, 2,000 to 6,000 oral and a vitamin C and 15 to 25 of vitamin C IV, glutathione, a couple of grams IV, multiminerals, two cc's, multivitamin, two cc's, and taurine. And then you can also put other things in them if you want. I, we use very little cholestyramine. We don't find it very effective in our patients. Uh, nystatin, we do use for candida. And then the different charcoals, you have to be careful about charcoals because a lot of people are sensitive to the source of the charcoal. Like for example, coconut, walnut, bituminous coal, anthracite, and so, Results, molds must be treated. They can be subtle, they can be chronic, they can be acute, and you want to avoid at all costs. They, they can result in cancer, arteriosclerosis, chronic degenerative nerve disease, 
Parkinson and multiple sclerosis. So uh, th I thank you for sharing our experience, and I do have this in my book. Thank you very much.